Hi, I am uh, extremely happy to be welcoming here Professor David Cope, uh, BJ Manzo, and uh, Jay Shim, director of uh, the film you already watched, you just watched. So thank you so much for being here with us. Um, this is a Q&A session, so uh, if there is any um, question, doubt, uh, uh, comment from the audience, please um, check in with us. And in the meantime, I have a lot of questions I would like to pose to everybody here. Uh, so I'll just start with some uh, trivia, probably. So my first curiosity is, how did the project of this film started? Uh, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, first off, thank you for everyone uh, attending and watching the screening. Um, happy to share the film and um, I know it's probably late where you are, but um, thanks for hanging in there. Um, I first heard about David Cope um, in a Radio Lab episode. It was a, it was a podcast. And um, that's when I heard his recombined version of um, the Emmy Beethoven Moonlight Sonata. And, um, you know, I, I liked it. I liked it. And I wanted to learn more. Um, and at the time, I was I just researched and read more into uh, David's work. I connected with him um, over email and then over the course of months, we just connected. And um, I've been a documentary filmmaker for a while now. And um, I expressed my interest in, in doing a film on his work and his ideas. And it just, uh, it went from there. But um, what, what appealed to me was, it, it felt like um, the equivalent of it felt like you know primordial cave paintings on the wall, but for for um, for computer music. So it felt like the beginnings of of years in the future. I feel this you know David's work will be uh, seen that way as the genesis of early artificial creativity. So I kind of um, I kind of took that and and um, you know I, I had fun with it. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, sure you yeah. did. Okay, so uh, what else? I know that there are some other folks here with me. Hi, Andrea. Well, if I can chime in, uh, being the one of the scientific chairs, I'm very happy to have uh, have you all here with us. I'm sorry for the light condition of my studio, which is almost dark here. And uh, uh, I'd like to pose a question to David Cope, because uh, I know him uh, from the books he, he, he wrote. And I was very interested into the, the film and in understanding the uh, wider context uh, uh, in which he uh, uh, worked. And... Um, um, he said that actually there is a sort, if I understood, there is a sort of struggle between intelligence and creativity. And if I understood, intelligence is characterized as uh, the, the capability of uh, predict. And I know that, uh, well, as far as I know, uh, uh, a large uh, uh, contribution uh, given by uh, David Cope uh, concern uh, intelligence and also in relation to his musical activity. So I'd like to, to if, if you can articulate a little bit about this sort of struggle in your life as a, as a scientist, but also mostly as a composer. So how these two aspects, creativity and intelligence can uh, stay together actually. I'm Microphone sorry. is muted. I think you're muted. Okay. Can yes. you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank yes. you. Okay. 
I don't know where I started in answering your question, but uh, uh, all my life I've, uh, and that's uh, since I'm 80, that's a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that got me going, and I don't know if this is answering your question or not, but that when I was, I believe around eight, I was, um, I was, my parents, my uh, sister and others uh, noticed that I was uh, fearful of heights. And uh, my mother found some kind of, uh, you know, uh, article or some kind of, uh, this is long before computers, obviously. And I... Um, she said, actually, that I should go out and climb the highest thing I could find. So I did. I walked across the street to a, there were four, oh my God, I don't know, maybe, it's hard to say exactly how tall they were, but they were, geez, I, I would say hundreds of feet high. And they were um, uh, essentially held in place by these wires um, in various layers. And so I went over and I climbed it uh, without looking down. And it was uh, built so that you could have little angles. And uh, that was... That was fun. Uh, actually, I'm laughing because it was not fun at all. But as I got to the top, there was a large bulb, I would say probably a foot wide, uh, blinking towards the city of Phoenix, where I was being raised. And I didn't know how to get down. There was no way. So I just held on unbelievably um, able to stay in that position. And then all of a sudden, a wind came up and all, well, not all necessarily, but a lot of the wires that were holding this in place, that is uh, angular, uh, were singing to me. And uh, I said, I might as well give it a try. So I slowly walked down backwards, listening and, and keeping a, um, you know, feeling that, you know, the... Um, the wires were singing to me. And I finally got down to the bottom and I went back home. This was at night. And uh, it was probably two in the morning by then. And I made an algorithm. Uh, my first, I don't, I don't know quite how to say it, but it was, I drew picture of what I felt was right. And then maybe 20 years later, I tried to and somehow uh, realize that in sound. Couldn't do it. 20 years later, same thing. 20 years later, same thing. I'm running out of 20 years. But finally, uh, it came to pass. And the reason I'm telling you this as a story, it doesn't seem to make, you know, a, make much sense uh, to the degree that the, um, the story made an important, again, I'm struggling for words, but 
I began to understand how, not how music so much worked, but how I sort of worked. And that from then on, I used algorithms for everything and learned list and began doing a lot of things. And if you've read some of my books, you might have read that little story, but it was, uh, it was incredibly important to me. I don't know if that answers your question at all. I, I just had to say that little bit of... Well, I think I understand the struggle, probably. That, that's, that's one of the points of your story, to, to, to be able to... Well, I, uh, to, to be able to, to catch this kind of difficulties and to understand how you can cope with them, maybe by trying cope. to cope. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I think so, actually. But I have, you know, food for thought, actually. So <laughs> fine. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I'm sorry right. for not really paying attention to your. I didn't know the question was coming to me. So therefore, <laughs> until the end, and therefore I was working my way backwards through your words but yes thank you thank you i actually have another question for professor cope if you don't mind uh now uh, of course uh, the emmy system is a system of a system of machine learning uh which is a very trendy term uh, yes. And it has been a very trendy term in the uh, last few years, but yep. actually uh, people has been doing, have been doing machine learning since the beginning of computing. Uh, so uh, I don't know, the, the, the fourth move, movement of the Iliac suite was, of course, machine learning yep. through Markov chains. Yep. Uh, but what struck me uh, and has always been striking me about your particular system is on the one hand, how accurate it is. And on the other hand, the fact that you can steer it somehow, you have the power to guide it where you want to, uh, where you want it to go. Uh, and the scene in the film uh, where uh, you were uh, asking the machine, please make it longer if you don't mind or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and now that was quite enlightening, actually. Uh, and my perception is that it's, uh, I mean, Amy and more generally the uh, your work uh, is on the one hand much more powerful and accurate than what you uh, learn you can do with uh, uh, just Markov cha chains or uh, factor or recall, oh, yeah. these yeah. things of kind of things. And on the other hand, is much more flexible than what you can get with neural networks, you know, and deep learning, where you basically have a black box and you have no real way to, you know, drive it the way you want you it want to go. Right. You know, um, so, okay. Uh, I would like to ask you to explain me the magic behind this, but I know that it would take, I don't know, maybe a lifetime. Uh, no, no. We only have a few minutes. So my question is, um, um, have you ever thought besides the uh, system you were showing, the novel generating system, have you ever thought to apply it to something else than just music or art? If I can say just about music or art. I mean, uh -huh. it looks like they, it has an amazing potential for, you know, the kind of problems that at the very least bring a lot of money and uh, fame and you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not interested in money. I, I just don't. I sell my art for a quarter. Okay. So if somebody wants it, they have to give me a quarter. Um, and I give it to them. And um, I, I, just, I just don't think that art, in whatever form it is, uh, should be based on that's, you know, that's how I, that's how I maintain uh, my, my life, if you will. 
And yeah, but I'm, I, I should get back to your main question. Could you put it in a, in a sentence? Yeah, sure. How generalizable is uh, your system? Okay, well, I try to make it, in, I try to, you know, write about it in the books in a way that's clear and, and not, um, you know, filled with uh, mathematical uh, things, although there's math in, involved. But I, yeah, I hope other people will try to do this. I mean, the whole thing has been that every time I try somebody else's version of how they'll proceed in the way, not that I have, have but necessarily, but, you know, they, and, and what happens is, is um, it doesn't work. So I, generally speaking, start like with art, uh, visual art. I start by uh, doing what other people have done, what other corporations have done, and it doesn't work at all. It's not creative, okay. if I may say so. And I would like it to be creative, and so therefore I write lots of code and uh, 20,000 line, lines, pages of code for Emmy before I actually got it to work. Uh, so it took a long, fairly long time, uh, more like eight years of my life. And, and it was, uh, you know, it, it, it was basically all my own. I mean, I just walk, went out and walked and thought and walked and thought. And, and as that process uh, engulfed me, I realized that I should be more interested in what I believe I can do rather than what AI and what other people do and corporations and money and et cetera that I can do. And so every one of my um, algorithms and uh, productions are completely mine. And, and uh, you know, some people uh, hate me for it. I love them, but they hate me. And it, it uh, has been a wonderful ride. Thank you. Now we have a question from our attendees, uh, from uh, Julius Smith. Uh, if intelligence is the ability to predict, why did we not lose our creativity long ago in our evolution? I think humans actually think of themselves as far more intelligent than we actually are. And I know that sounds rather abrupt, and uh, but it's it's uh, true, and part of that is the result of creativity. That is, you try things, they fail, and you push this and you push that and you push that button, and you end up uh, sometime making a decision when you hear something that you really love, and I do really love the results of many of my pieces, as some of them, not my pieces, but Emmy and my pieces, and, and uh, uh, other of my uh, programs. And uh, I don't know what else to say regarding that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, I don't want to hijack completely this uh, talk, so please. Um, uh, but if I still have a um, small spot for one of my countless questions, I would have one for Vijay Manzo, actually. Okay. Um, 
Hi. I, hi. Uh, hi. Nice to you. Good to see you. Haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> yeah, it has been a while. <laughs> yeah, maybe what, seven or eight years? I think so, yeah. Something like that, yeah. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm, I, I loved the documentary. I loved everything about being on this panel discussion. I don't know what they're broadcasting, but I'm just having a blast. It's great. It's great hearing you talk. It's great here. I, you know, I, I, before we get to your question, what I watched the screener uh, that Jay sent me and last line of the film, um, it's a work in progress. I almost screamed at the top of my lungs because that says it all. 80 years into this, you know, it's a work in progress. That's what it <laughs> if you, you, you know, I have students all the time that say like, oh, how do you get started with this? And the answer is it's a work in progress. Eight years bumping up into failure and not quitting, you know, until you get it right. You know, that that is what it takes to to do this. So I loved it. I love I loved the whole documentary. I loved hearing you speak about it. And, and I'm I'm just enjoying hearing you speak about this this now. It's really great. So great. Thank you. Yeah. You honor me. Oh. Um, it the honor is mine. And you know, I I will just say again, like hearing the stories, that whole journey, that was not lost on me. That not at all. I get it and I tell that story and I'm so glad that now we have this documentary to also go out and tell that story because it's a story worth telling and it's one that a lot of people need to hear. Good point. Mm. Yeah, amazing. Uh, now, uh, well, BJ Manza, so very nice to meet you. I wonder if we met a few years ago, but I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to ask you something about sonification, since it's uh, what you talk about in the film, basically, and more specifically to how um, sonification can relate to a uh, uh, rule-based and uh, um, learning-based systems such as uh, EMI, which is something you kind of hint at uh, during your intervention. So uh, it struck me because actually what uh, you say uh, is somehow something I always say. I, I, I tell all the time to my students, so sonification is actually a musical act. is not just taking some random data and plotting them on a frequency axis. And right. even if you do so, then it's a musical act, uh, nonetheless. Uh, but I would like you to elaborate a little bit upon this, if you would like. So um, yes. what does it mean to... Uh, sonify and at the same time respect the uh, set of rules somehow and respect the uh, uh, received style more or less where where does it take you sure I, and that, that is a great question um and i was i forgot that i had said that when i watched the documentary mm -hmm. but i'm but i'm glad that i did um you know again a lot of times i, I deal with students and you know, it would be great if there was some sort of divine mapping, you know, that, you know, that you could just discover. But what you find when you make these tools or when you use a tool is that you have to, you start making subjective decisions the kind of right out of the right out of the gate. And those subjective decisions, that's you. That's your essence that comes through there, you know, and of course, there are ways that you can make make it more objective and whatnot. But um, that's the fun. You know, you you make this tool. All right. So we're talking about like Dave's work. Right. So you make he made this tool. He had this creative idea and he was like, I got to facilitate this creative idea in some way. So he goes and makes a tool to to do that. And that in itself, I will just say thousands of years of musicians doing that exact same thing, right? So it's not always just technology, digital technology. It's just that same I, that same creative spirit that I'm going to make a tool to help me do this thing and it's going to do a, a function for me. And then while you're making this tool and you're using this tool, sometimes this magical thing happens where you interact with it and you can start to see that tool give you feedback. Obviously, Emily Howell does that 
in a in a very literal way, but other tools give you feedback in other ways, and you start to see the tool making process as being part of the art form. You know, that that's part of the artistic process too, is that you make this thing and then if if you're lucky, it also gives you some hints and some suggestions about how your art might develop. So um so that that's like a fundamental thing about sonification is that you what you bring to it as an artist, as a composer, as a human being, all of that can get factored into it. And um and I I think it would uh I'll, I mean, I'll just I'll just say that. So in terms of the the work that I actually that I do with sonification, part of the problem that we often deal with is that data is invisible. Um, certain uh, people don't really handle abstraction as well as some others, and so you know we plot things on charts, and then some people can get that. Some people don't quite understand that, but that's one that we all kind of are familiar with. That's one type of mapping that we're familiar with. But we hear music is ubiquitous. We all hear music. We all love music. We all respond to it. So uh, with the particular tool that's in the documentary, that was the intention. We're taking something really abstract, like this chemical engineering data. I'm not a chemical engineer, but I, but I work with one at WPI. Um, and we're trying to explain to people about really students about some aspects of what's happening here using something that is a little bit more familiar, which is music. Well, thank you. Um, so, uh, well, maybe, uh, maybe I can ask a, a last question, maybe considering our uh, schedule. And uh, I had a curiosity for Jai and maybe also for David. Uh, Opcop is uh, well, a documentary, because it deals with the work of David Cope. But at the same time, well, it is a sort of strange documentary in the sense that it does not deal with a chronological order, you know. Uh, um, he, he was born in, maybe in Phoenix, I don't know if I understood clearly. Uh, and then uh, he graduated and then he started working. So <laughs> we have an organization which has been uh, an organization in terms of themes, and there is a specific script dealing with themes and also uh, with uh, um, uh, putting together uh, uh, a contribution from others like uh, uh, Greenberg, Bernard Greenberg. So uh, I'd like to know how you, uh, uh, you dealt with this uh, script, actually, and if you coordinated yourself with David concerning the sort of thematic organization of the script? Well, that's a great question. And I think, um, yeah, you're seeing kind of my approach to the film. And I like to think of myself as a, a writer. I like to, I, I like to uh, approach things as a writer. So um, it actually took some time for, for me to develop this approach, an approach, because of uh, several factors. One of which I live in Los Angeles and David lives in Santa Cruz. And so we're around five hours apart, and which, isn't, which isn't that um, far, relatively speaking, in the United States. But, you know, this, this is my first feature film project. I, was, I work freelance. Um, so I would film this in parts. My first initial contact with David was a, a long interview. Um, and it became increasingly clear in the edit that I, I didn't want a film to just be uh, an interview for most of the time. And uh, the way I, I want to approach a, a film um, is, you know, not necessarily a traditional documentary, but, but uh, make it feel like you're experiencing something as, as it's unfolding, like it's, it's live, like it's alive. Um, and so on one of my trips to Santa Cruz, you know, I, I, hanging out with David with my camera, he started um, working on a draft for one of his uh, many new books at the time. And he just started brainstorming bullet points and, and and I, I just started filming. And, and from there, that kind of sparked the idea of, of um, how I can creatively explore certain themes um, and, and kind of coordinate with Dave, like you, like you suggested. 
and others to to tell um, a story about creativity and and David Cope's specific flavor of creativity um, and, and keep the scope narrow because I didn't want a film that was so broad about artificial intelligence or algorithmic music in general. So that to be, I wanted to keep it a narrow focus and play with the structure. And, and that involved me diving into a lot of David's literature, his, his, his uh, autobiographies. A common theme in his own work is he likes to use haikus um, in his music and uh, books as well. So all these references to his uh, work, I wanted to incorporate structurally and kind of blend as you saw, you know, with the machine and human uh, creative works together in, in, into the film. Um, and then and another challenge was, of course, David, David doesn't like to leave the house. He, he likes to work and um, rightfully so. And, and so it was a challenge. I, it would, you know, I originally thought I could do a, maybe a verite doc where I followed Dave around and while stuff happens, but that was not, that I learned quickly that's not going to happen. So uh, that was part of the process. And how, how can we get, how can we go inside, you know, his uh, imagination and how, do, how can I capture that and convey his, 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 the musicality and, and the creativity um, of his world. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So unless we have more questions from the audience, I'm going to chat the chat, but I don't think so. Um, I think we can say goodbye or good night, depending on the time zone now. Yeah. So thank you so much for uh, being here. And of course, unless uh, anyone uh, of you wants to add any more comments. So in this okay. case, we have time. But David, want to say something? <laughs> um yeah it's been fun i mean yeah <laughs> for us too <laughs> uh okay so great thank you very much for being with us and uh, uh for our audience see you tomorrow at noon for the second day of the conference and uh david vj and jay hope that we can cross paths again uh anytime soon Same. thank you very much I Thanks so. a lot. And Thanks, been an honor yeah. and a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow at the conference.